Uh, okay. Uh, yes, I already introduced myself, uh, and so I can skip this part. I just want to mention that my PhD was in adult education, and then I started working in higher education, especially in the topic of staff professional development and academic innovation. So I hope we might have some common uh, points and lines. I will try uh, to stay into the half an hour because I would like to leave the second part of this session for a more interactive perspective. And I'm happy that uh, since I will be talking about teaching and learning and about teachers learning, which is maybe not something that we talk about uh, usually, I would be happy to know your opinion, your feedback, and your perspective. Uh, yes, I've been working and collaborating with the Tuning Academy since uh, 2010 uh, in Tuning Russia in another project which is uh, Tuning Europe and United States study. So what I'm going to talk about. Basically, I will move through these points. This is a bit my, the outline of my uh, presentation. I will move from, of course, the purpose of the research and the, a bit of the theoretical framework. What is the methodology? So I decided to use a multiple case study approach, so I will say something about that. This is a replication of a study that I have already done in my first scholarship year at DITA. So basically I did the first study, then I did the second study. So I will be presenting both results, but focusing a little bit more on the second study, of course. Uh, presenting, of course, some of the preliminary results and the needs that emerge from these case studies. And then you think that the presentation might be over, but will be not. Because after the results, I have a second part of the research in which I try to go back to the literature and to the international practice to see whether uh, and how it's possible to address the needs that came out from, from the teachers. Then I will give some preliminary suggestions and possible models uh, to the Tuning Academy that helped me in this, uh, in this month, and I will go to explain briefly strengths and weaknesses of my research. Okay, okay, what was the main objective, the main aim of my research? Was to see the level of implementation of conference-based approach in the teaching practice. We all know that we had the Bologna process, we had the use of competence and learning outcomes in developing curricula, in developing uh, syllabi, but how is the situation in the teaching practice, in class? So what are the challenges, the problems that teachers nowadays are facing? And what can be a possible support that we can give and provide to teachers to improve their teaching? And then, of course, uh, since I am in, in the Tuning Academy, we would like to know, and we uh, were discussing about what was or what can be the tuning contribution to this academic innovation. I would like not to enter in detail about competence-based education. I guess that more or less we are all familiar with this, uh, um, with this approach, uh, which is an umbrella that includes teaching approaches, which use competences as a starting point, of course, to designing uh, contents and goals of education. Uh, after that competence-based education came, we had several uh, approaches, especially from the constructivist perspective, that try to develop uh, approaches, methods, uh, teaching, learning strategies, assessment strategies to implement competence-based learning. But there are still some challenges that uh, uh, teachers are facing all over the world in implementing this competence-based approach. And I will encounter a nice article. Uh, I'm mentioning briefly this article uh, because this author, I like something that came out from my results. So what are the challenges in this post-2015 agenda? The reform process, for example, has been very ambitious So in this which from teacher-centered approach to student-centered approach. They were very ambitious uh, the, in, in terms of uh, asking you know, uh, teachers to move from one to the other. Learning and physical resources not all the time were present. And uh, teacher, uh, uh, teachers are never, have never been taught in, uh, in pedagogical issues. I don't know if the, the, the teacher present have some experience in teacher training, but the majority of the teachers don't. So they teach 
in the way they have been taught or in the way they learn themselves how to teach. And so, of course, there might be lack of personal experience, lack of training. Sometimes the culture even might be an obstacle. The national institutional cultures might not be supportive in practice, the implementation of this approach. And then there is a huge problem about assessment. How do we assess competencies? Uh, again, I'm not going in detail in the theoretical framework because I think it's more interesting uh, discussing a little bit the findings, but if you want later on we can go back to this model, which is quite interesting because if we consider at the core uh, of, the, of the model, university teacher pedagogical ways of teaching and practicing and uh, conception of teaching, then we look at the implementation, of course, a teacher has some beliefs about teaching, then he or she transfers into practice, she, uh, let's say she, because we have some, some women here, uh, develops uh, learning outcomes, prepare a uh, learning environment, uh, uh, learning materials, and all the rest. But if we look behind the conception, we have several elements all interrelating among them. So basically the idea of having a, a conception, a belief about teaching means that we have a personal idea as a teacher, we have influence from department institutions, we have influence from academic communities, the validating bodies, we have influence from the subject area, we have influence from uh, you know, pedagogical um, expertise, and so we need to think that asking teachers to change the way in which they teach means moving something and it's quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, requires quite an effort and a support. Okay, let's go to, to the research. I decided to use qualitative research and in particular my, uh, my approach was a multiple case study. So I've been doing different case studies for uh, each uh, case study. I was collecting documents, so starting from a documentary uh, analysis and then going uh, to uh, a team structure interview to some teachers. The teachers have been the, the key uh, participants in my research. You will not see probably anything from this slide, but let me explain because I, I try to, to put everything here just to have you, uh, you know, um, kind of graphical view. Of course, I design, I design the research first. I design the protocol and I designed how to select my cases. This was the, the design part. Then I started single case data analysis and collection. So as I said, uh, documentary analysis and interview. And I was being, of course I transcribed the interview, especially for the first study, the second one, and I'm still working on that. And identifying some main emerging themes, some categories, individually for each case study. And then I move, I move to a more cross analysis. So what is common, what is different in the different case studies that I've been developing? Just for you to know, these are two guiding books that I was using for the methodological part of the multiple case study analysis. And of course, Robert Dean is very famous in general for case studies, single multiple case study. So what about the sample? just for you to have an idea. Of course, it was a convenient, convenient sample. I started in the study one, let's say in January, to interview teachers from the Sagmin subject area group of education, so with an expertise on education, that have been participating in previous tuning projects all over the world. I sent them an invitation, of course, not all of them answered, so and I collected the availability of people to do the interview. Then I did the same in, in November with uh, teachers from scientific fields because I want to have the, you know, to enrich a little bit the perspective of who is not involved in uh, educational research but is a teacher anyhow. So civil engineering, ICT, physics. And that was not very easy to catch 
these people, to be honest with you. And I'm very thankful to some of the people, like Maria, the other Maria, everyone, helping me in finding these people and try to speak with them. Because, of course, academics are busy people and have several other priorities. So it was compulsory that they had, uh, still have teaching experience or experience in designing subjects and curricula. Of course, availability and English speaking. I also interview in Spanish, let's say. I try somehow to, to do it with my Italian background. Okay, this is a, just a picture of the first sample. So all these teachers from education, from the different universities, from all over the world, with different experiences, and you might see uh, belonging to different projects, uh, uh, tuning projects. I wanted them to have some tuning experience because some part of the research was about tuning impact as well. And this is the second picture. You, you see some of the teachers uh, are in red because uh, they are scheduled for the next week. So uh, they are catch, uh, I've catch them at the very end of the scholarship, but still I want to speak with them. So this is the second um, uh, picture. Okay, the interview protocol, of course, covers, you remember the two main key questions. So implementation of the competence-based approach in your class, what happened in the class. So uh, this list of questions uh, are related to these uh, key points first. And then tuning impact. So as tuning uh, an, inf uh, an influence or uh, do you think it can do, can do, can be uh, supportive uh, in, in developing and enriching the teaching practice? Okay, I will now focus a little bit of some results because I think this is a, a quite interesting part uh, that I would like to show and to discuss with you. So, as for the first question, our level of implementation of content-based approach in the teaching practice. What I did was to try, well, again, you will not probably see all of these, but I will speak about that and we can consider to come back later on. So these are the major themes uh, emerged from the interview. I don't know if you're familiar with the content analysis. So I did the transcription and then I was coding all the qualitative data and then I was grouping the codes in the major categories. Some of the categories came from the literature. So I was using both, let's say, bottom-up approach from the text and top-down from the literature to interpret uh, those data. So what happened about uh, competence-based learning? There seems to be a quite clear, uh, let's say, perspective on what is competence-based learning, what it's about. It is about the shifting from student centers, from teacher centers to student center approach. There seems to be already some kind of implementation, for example, yes, ongoing process of implementation by different stages, use of common language, um, use of competence-based approach in international curricula, uh, use of the approach to, to create profile and finding a balance with national standards, for example, that the most relevant and interesting part for me was this one, open challenges. So what is still problematic in using the competence-based approach? And the yellow codes are not the, the most important one, but the very new one in the second study. So uh, the majority of the themes were touched in both studies, uh, both from education and uh, uh, scientific field. And in yellow, uh, you might see the very, the very new one. So what are the challenges? That the level of implementation is poor compared to the level of regulation. It's still poor what happens in the class. It is not, of course, the case of all the situation, but it's rather common that there are quite a lot of challenging, uh, challenges for, for that. Uh, it is not always clear what is the relation, for example, between competence and learning outcomes, how to deal with the assessment of the competence, uh, how to involve the stakeholder in the program. For example, you are experts in the entrepreneurial uh, uh, things that so might be interesting for you also. And then this part was quite interesting because 
some of them were saying this approach is uh, challenging this academic freedom. So the idea that academics have academics have they, their own idea on how to implement the teaching. So the idea of sharing and being you know, a group of teachers working together, balancing the competencies and learning outcomes, sharing teaching and learning expertise is not, let's say, from all of them very welcome, or, or at least they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to, to work in a more collective and collaborative way. Okay, let me go back. Okay. Then let's do a further step. Confidence based approach, you know, what do you think? Then teaching learning activities, what happens? I was using in this case the study of Beatles, Striving and the Shi from twenty thirteen to interpret the main uh, the main categories the the the, the, the code, codes that were emerging. And then we have I will read it for you because the third one is not very visible, active involvement of students, teachers as facilitators and authentic assessment. And I have to say that I have collected several interesting practices. So the, the, there is something going on, trying to use, for example, teamwork, try to use flipper classroom, try to be sometimes mediators between the content and the students. So I did like the, the idea of from, from one of the, the, the two, actually, of the people were insisting on the idea of being a kind of mediation between students uh, and, and, and the content. But still, I will go to the most difficult part because if, the, if we want to improve, we need to start from the needs, right? Uh, still some relevant challenges. For example, side of the class. I, I, I am expecting to interact with the students if I have 200 students. This was very common answer from, from some of the teachers, for example. The level of the students, not, uh, undergraduate or graduate, you can do something with graduate students that you can't do with undergraduate students, for example. Experience of teacher in using the methodology, I never use problem-based learning, how am I supposed to try, where to start, how do I learn new methodology, I might be willing to do that, but how do I do that, who is helping me in that? And then the third element that I want to, I'd like, no, again, what is, it? What is about tuning? So. I've been asking, if you think about this confidence-based approach and your experience, uh, and you have been participating in tuning, where do you put tuning in this uh, big framework? Well, the, the what's very, very interesting, and I, I think I'm very lucky that I have had the chance to speak with this teacher, because I had quite a, a wide perspective. So from the, the tuning, contribution. It was clear that there were some tools considered very relevant. I don't know if all of us are familiar with the tuning methodology, but for example, how to design generic competencies or subject-specific competencies. For example, what is the meaning of generic or subject-specific competencies? The idea of using a systematic approach to develop the curriculum and to develop the, the syllabus the idea of doing the consultation process, and several tools that the tuning methodology offers, as well as the experience itself. So I have some practical tools, but also I have the experience of being with colleagues from my same, my same, let's say, subject area. They work together in the tuning methodology, grouped by subject area, so the, the teachers from the same subject area from different universities and have the opportunity to discuss, to dialogue, to reflect, to build the new conceptual frameworks. Because sometimes they were saying, when you teach, you teach. Because you don't have time to think and rethink, you know? So you just teach and then you run to another place and then you have a paper to write and then you run at home and then you run again. So it's quite a, 
uh, stressful life. Uh, and so the opportunity also to sit and reflect and rethink about the teaching. But again, let's go to the most interesting part of the problems. But there are still some problems uh, in the methodology, um, but not only in the methodology, but some of these problems are related also to the approach, the competence-based approach, not the tuning uh, itself. For example, need of uh, more flexibility, need to find a balance between academic freedom and collective approach, you know, again, uh, the academics have more interest in theoretical level than in practical one. They say, yes, competence, to design the competence is very nice, it's relevant, but then they go back to the previous practice because they are more used to do that. Um, there is not enough research-based activities. For example, if I'm willing to do something new in my course, how do I see if it works or not? How do I monitor it? it might be that the learning of the students is exactly the same. Do we have strategies to do that? This, this is quite a relevant question. Eh? Um, so, for example, after the wonderful experience of tuning, then what else? I mean, we, we don't see each other. I met some very nice colleagues, but we don't have the opportunity anymore to develop it. And so, uh, how can we improve if then we, we forget the experience and we go back to, to the reality? So, this just to mention for you the main, uh, the main elements um, that, uh, that came out. And I try to group, let's say, these, uh, these models, some of the, let's say, emerging needs uh, that they group in, in three uh, areas. One is practical guidance and indication. Can you tuning or can you, can somebody in the world provide us some practical guidance and indication? So I have understood as a teacher that I need to try to implement complex based approach. Can you help me practically in, in speaking with the students, in understanding their needs, in making them, working in groups. And, uh, okay, at two levels, some, somehow to have the guidelines, and in, at the second level, to try to have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, pilot exercise of that, even within the project, when the tuning project is still running and the tuning project runs for two or three years, for example, in, uh, in average. Then training, they ask for training. So almost all of them, they ask for, can, can, can we have a training about teaching and learning assessment activities, academic soft skills, for example, communication, so how to interact and communicate with the students and, and collect feedback from the students. Um, assessment, uh, as I said, one of the key topics. And then a third part uh, that I call research scholarly practice, let's say. So uh, they were asking to further opportunity of sharing, but in a, you know, in a um, way which is help and support. Because if, they, if you just say to, to them, you need to share, they, they say, yes, in general I can share, but how I can share, with whom, uh, with what kind of tools I can use. A need of recognition and reward for teaching efforts. This is a huge problem because, I, for example, in Italy there is no recognition, almost at all, about teaching. So all the career of academics are research-based. So majority of the, the teachers are saying, why I do spend all this time and effort uh, if I look at my career, okay, can I have some kind of uh, recognition on one hand, and on the other hand, the idea of research base is the idea of monitoring. So if I do something different in my course, can I, how can I can monitor that it's working or not. So this part was the part that was mo the most interesting for me because I was thinking about this part as 
also self-directed learning for teachers, so possible resources that teachers might use, even themselves, if there are resources available somewhere, somehow. So after analyzing the data, I've been asking myself how to address this need. What strategies are already present in literature or international practice? So not to discover, uh, again, what is already discovered by others. What suggestions can be offered for the Tuning Academy, since the, the scholarship was for the Tuning Academy, from this research? Okay, what I did was, well, when you want to discover something, you go online and in Google. This is something that we all do, right? And I have discovered that there are uh, units called Academic Teaching and Learning Center. Sometimes are called Staff Development Units. There are several, uh, yes, university units devoted to staff development, devoted to improvement of teaching, devoted to academic innovation. Uh, and of course, the, this tradition is more from the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, but still there is a good contamination of that in, in other countries uh, all over the world. And I have encountered the International Consortium for Educational Development, which is a huge network that brings together all the national networks of, on staff development for teachers, academic staff development. So I went to these national networks and I selected the two websites, two random websites uh, of uh, each country to study a little bit the models of teaching learning centers, teaching learning units. What do they do to support teachers in, in, in being better teachers, let's say? And you might see here is just a preliminary you know, representation just to give you an idea. The majority of the case, they do workshops, they do training. So they provide some kind of training, okay? They organize uh, some training, which is related to, uh, to design a course, uh, uh, teaching learning activities, uh, or it might be something very general or very specific. But I also found something else which was very different and very interesting for me. Building communities. Why don't we use peer learning instead of having only experts from outside that can support? Why don't we ask teachers to help each other since they have huge uh, experience and expertise? Why don't we use examples of teaching? So why don't we use um, repository of good practice already existing by, by teachers? And this is another model that I will uh, explain in a while, which is called scholarship of teaching and learning. So, scholarship of teaching and learning. And I, I've been reading quite a lot about this scholarship of teaching and learning because I was interested in, in understanding how in the world they use scholarship of teaching and learning and why. So to give you an idea about, uh, again, communities uh, and about uh, developing of scholarship of teaching and learning, what is a faculty learning community? So why, why they, they are grouping uh, some teachers together to do what? So you might be already familiar with this concept. Uh, I took the definition from Cox 2004, which is one of the most, uh, let's say, recognized experts. Uh, in, uh, in this field. So faculty, a group of six to 15 members, let's say, who engages in an co active collaborative year-long program with a curriculum about enhancing teaching and learning with frequent, frequent seminars, activities to provide learning development, possibly scholarship of teaching and learning, which I will describe in a while, and community building. So there are a group of teachers that decide within their academic work, this can be in presence, this can be as well at distance, to meet and to work together in a particular topic. Might be cohort based, so for example, all junior faculty, all senior faculty, all faculty from law, like for example, or might be 
cross disciplinary in a topic. All people interested in teamwork, uh, making students work in teams. All people interested might join this group and might work together. How do they do? I've been reading and I have also an example if you have time later on to have a look at this video. They start from literature analysis. They share the experience that they might already have in individual teaching practice. And they build some reflection, some knowledge on that in order to have at the very end a clear view about, for example, this methodology in order to be able to bring it, implement it, and share it with other people. What is scholarship of teaching and learning? This is even more interesting because, of course, the idea of faculty learning communities, especially nowadays with the online communities, is more or less well known. But what is scholarship of teaching and learning? Emerging movement of scholarly thought and action that draws on the reciprocal relationship between teaching and learning at the post-secondary level, mainly in academic uh, situation. Important goal is to enhance and augment learning amongst and between individual learning by investigating the main features of discipline-specific expertise and best pedagogical practice. So that is the interesting part, is research on teaching. So you and all of us as a teacher or a future teacher or uh, uh, we do research, right? We do research. Uh, research is an important part of an academic. So the research is mainly on, on our field of expertise. But the research can be also on teaching our field of expertise, which means uh, monitoring my teaching, collecting data from students, uh, from doing surveys uh, or focus group with the students, or even if we want to look at the impact, interviewing the students afterwards uh, or doing a, a questionnaire afterwards, uh, looking at the learning outcomes. Uh, and the idea of scholarship of teaching and learning is also to have a final product, uh, to have a final paper which summarizes uh, all these findings that can be submitted to a journal. There are several journals, some of them are open, general, scholarship of teaching and learning in whatever, and some are um, discipline-based. So is, uh, I don't know, a journal of teaching in engineering, a journal of teaching in law, these kind of things, and or normal corpus journals. But people might not know that there is a possibility to do research in the teaching as well. Okay, so what for us? What is uh, useful uh, from all these interesting, at least interesting for me, things for, for tuning? I will, I will, I've been thinking about something that might be useful for, for the tuning community uh, as well. So I will conclude now with um, kind of my proposal and my perspective. Uh, which is, of course, uh, open to the, to the debate. So I thought about a possible model for scholarly good practice collection. So a possibility to build a repository of good examples of good practices, which can be a starting point of doing research. Of course, doing research in teaching might be not very easy because we don't know how to collect the data from the students. We don't know exactly how to write a scientific paper with some educational aspects. Uh, and so I, I, I've been thinking that this evidence-based uh, approach might be applied, applied at the beginning of some best practice. So all teachers have some expertise in teaching in their own fields. So I'm sure that you are for sure experts in what you teach. So you can, you, I'm saying you, but in general, the idea is, is that teachers may try to describe their own practice. There should be a, some kind of uh, board, some kind of, uh, you know, control of the, of the quality of the best practice. But then the idea is to build a free access uh, database of examples, always upgradable and self-sustainable. And I've been finding several examples of this, some open access, some access uh, 
I mean, open for uh, particular communities in which the learning is self-directed by teachers because it's peer learning. And for example, uh, I thought a possible structure that can be used and then probably we might decide to pilot already in, uh, in, uh, in the tuning, in tuning project. And then, what about the communities? How do the faculty communities apply to tuning? Because if you think about your institution, you might propose to the institution to introduce faculty learning communities as a part of the academic innovation strategy. But for example, with tuning, what can be? Uh, so I was thinking about a hypothetical, ex a hypothetical example of a faculty learning community, for example, in medicine. So what can be uh, the, this model applied to, to the tuning? So mission, and I, I try to structure using the structure that is used in literature for faculty learning communities. So for example, a uh, group of uh, teachers from medicine that want to depend active learning strategies in medicine, quite rather general aim. So they develop a curriculum, so they develop a kind of, of course, program to be developed. I don't know, peer learning, collaborative learning, cooperative learning, as part of the, the major task. I'm just thinking in general, right? They might have a facilitator, and they might be members from subject area group from medicine that want to participate, for example, online, which is probably more feasible. They might invite and connect with society already existing in teaching medicine. They might ask consultants or student representatives to come because it's important that thinking about teacher learning, we consider that the, the final outcome will be the students learning more. So we need to, to keep in mind that uh, contact with the students is relevant. So for example, they might meet every month uh, with a seminar or online seminar, and, then, and they might, and this is very recommended in literature, have a final conference, a final event. So they work to produce something that then will, will be shared with the, the community. They start with the literature, example of participants, individual teaching projects, and then final publication. It is recommended in, in literature uh, as much as possible to uh, uh, finalize uh, a teaching effort in a publication, in a, something which is concrete, which is good for the, uh, the career of the teacher, but good also for the teaching community. How do we assess that? We, we ask a satisfaction of participants. We might um, establish some peer evaluation. Uh, we might, and then that is the, the most relevant uh, element, try to assess the impact of the community on the, on the students' learning. OK, I have finished for now. Uh, just for you to know that uh, there are, of course, some strengths like uh, deep understanding of competence-based and tuning influence, new ideas for future strategy for support the improvement of teaching activities. Um, but of course, we need to keep in mind that that was a qualitative study, so I will not be able to generalize the results that was not the aim. We need to keep under control the intercultural dimension, and we remember at the very beginning, the big scheme. So we need to remember that teachers have also a context, and we need to consider what can be done and what cannot be done within this context. And of course, I did some proposals based on my study, on my research, talking with people, but we need to test the model, of course. As always, we need to test the model to see whether it works or not, or what can be, can be improved. So that's all for my side. Thank you very much for your attention.